Well, I'm sure you've all heard of the phrase drop back and punt. And that's what we're going to have to do here. Any, any of you guys out there that have worked on the rear suspension of a 944, you would know that the back uses torsion bars rather than coil springs like the front does. Very much like the 911 does. So one problem with the 944 though is the torsion bars can't be removed with the rear suspension in the car. Two reasons. On a 911, the torsion bar end, this is actually, you know, they call it the spring plate because this, this has the splines in it for the, the, the springy end of the torsion bar. But on a 911, it just has the four bolts like this has, except that is just the cover that holds the bushing in and holds everything together. On a 944, as you can see, this whole cast aluminum piece is what holds the torsion bar tube to the car. I mean, this is, this is the main bit right here, um, up there, that's where the big bolt goes. And also at the back and the top here, you have this part that bolts to this piece that bolts to the chassis. There's also this part here, which is what attaches this rear wing of the inner part of the torsion bar tube to the chassis on the inside here. But anyway, as you can see, the torsion bar is in there. And even if this did have a, uh, a cap over it, it would, you still couldn't get the torsion bar out because the body's in the way. On 911, right about there, there's, there's a round cover plate that is held on with one bolt. And you, Take that out and then you can pull the plate off of the torsion bar and you can pull the torsion bar out. So this creates a quandary for us 944 owners who want to mess with the rear suspension. A lot of people will just pull the torsion bars out and convert it to coil overs. Basically you have a coil over that bolts in where the shock goes. And they make them. They're, they're not cheap or anything, but they do make them. But anyway, back to our little problem. So, when we put this together, we pulled the old torsion bars out, which were 24 millimeters, and we installed 30 millimeter torsion bars. Now, I thought at the time the right thing to do was to go by our marking, which you can actually still see it right there, our scribe mark on this part, to make sure we got the indexing exactly the same as it was when we pulled it out. Now on a, on a torsion bar, it's got splines at either end. One end has 44, mil, four, 44 splines, and I think the other end has 40 splines. So basically you can put them in different ways and attach the spring plate on in different ways to get different heights in the back of the car. And other than the, uh, the eccentric adjustment here to adjust the ride height, indexing the splines is the way you do it. That's how you do it on a 911 too. But like I said before, you can't get the, the torsion bars out with the suspension in the car. And the rear suspension is a big pain in the butt to get in and out. So if you don't get it the right the first time, like I didn't, that means you get to take the front, the rear suspension out again. So that's what we're going to do. One thing we did do to uh, kind of make our life a little easier was I ordered a set of Elephant Racing, a 
adjustable rear spring plates. That does two things for us. One is it basically will give us uh, about an inch of ride height adjustment without removing the torsion bar. So if, if you get pretty close, I mean, you can adjust it. The other thing is it is it is open on this end so you can actually pull the torsion bars out you can unload them basically this this bottom bolt here in the back and this little sleeve that goes over the bolt are basically the stop for the the arm here so when you pull that out the, the torsion bar is unloaded so theoretically with the uh, the uh, elephant racing part, I mean, you would still you would have to make a hole in the body here, which isn't that big of a deal. But then you'd be able to change the torsion bars if you need to. So I thought that was a good option to do. So when we pull this out next week, we'll probably get those uh, adjust those adjustable spring plates in, and um, then we'll uh, get that all together. One other little update to the uh, Atomic LS system. I did call MSD on Monday and um, they're, they're kind of all coronavirus locked down like everybody else is right now. So, But I talked to a good guy in the, uh, the tech support department and he's you know basically working from home this week but he said next tuesday he will be in the shop and he knew exactly what i was talking about with the the fuel rail brackets and he said that yeah those fuel rail brackets will not work on this intake manifold but he said he said to call him next tuesday when he's in and he would look around in the shop because they probably have a set of the right brackets for this. And he said he'd just send them to me. So hopefully that works out. That would be nice. Then I won't have to make something to uh, attach these fuel rails. <laughs> and, uh, but I did ask him about the, uh, the oil pressure sender. This doesn't work with the oil pressure sender that is on this engine. And he looked it up and he said the, the there is no code in the computer for oil pressure so if if you just leave this unplugged it's not going to cause any problems with the system that's he said that's more for information and one of the things I didn't talk about in my explanation of that uh, system was that the uh, if you leave the controller in the car, it actually has a dashboard set up, which it uh, basically has oil pressure, water temperature, engine RPM, and you know anything else that the sensors are measuring. It just displays it in the dashboard on here, which is kind of cool. So that's one of the other reasons to keep it, you know, attached and in the car, because you can you can use it for that stuff, but. What, what we need to do is uh, we weren't even going to use this because the Renegade Hybrids kit comes with an adapter that screws into here and goes to 8th inch national pipe thread and they give you a temperature sender, I mean an oil pressure sender that works with the, the gauge that's in the car. So basically you take this out, you put the adapter in, and you screw the, the pressure sender into there, and then you just hook the wires up to it that go to the gauge in the car. So engine-wise, this is all going to work out pretty well. Suspension-wise, eh, we got some work to do. Well, here we is. We got the uh, suspension all unbolted and such. I really hate doing this. This is like this is like the worst part of working on one of these cars, is this suspension. <laughs> it's, 
it's really heavy, so you uh, and there's no good attachment points for it. Like I, I used a spare tire on on some wood over here to hold the back up. The front part, and over here I just use a block of wood on the studs on the wheel because you can't let it rest on the caliper because the brake line goes right across the bottom from one side of the caliper to the other. But anyway, we got all the brake lines done, undone. We got the uh, all the bolts undone. It's actually down a few inches right now, sitting on uh, these jack stands here. Where's that jack stand? <laughs> yeah, there. And the spare tire and the chunk of wood there. So I don't plan on pulling this out from under the car. I'm just going to get the front down as low as possible to get the spring plates off. And that should be good enough for what we got to do. One of the main reasons I did that, I didn't want to undo the handbrake cables again because they're a royal pain in the butt. So you don't want to have to do that if you don't have to. And I think I can probably get the spring plate low enough that I can get the torsion bar in and out as far as I need to. You don't need to take it all the way out. You just need to pull it out far enough so it's out of the spline and turn it and re-index it. So that's where we're at now. Probably tomorrow after work we'll um, get it down far enough that we can actually start doing the the indexing okay one thing that I completely forgot about with uh, being able to remove the torsion bars from the back of one of these things is that the control arm actually needs to be unbolted so that is gonna be these three bolts have to come out and I don't know if I can get it out of the way. Probably not. So that means I'm probably going to have to go up under the car and see if we can shed some light on this here. Ah, there we go. The uh, probably have to remove the the pivot bolt for the control arm. So that's. <laughs> it's gonna be uh, I mean removing the bolts is no big deal but actually you know having this fairly heavy assembly with the brake cable still connected to it sitting someplace off to the side out of the way is going to be uh, just a little bit tricky so yeah okay well we'll get at it <laughs> 